30th of June, 1916. The sun sets over the Somme, but the artillery bombardment continues. Thousands of men wait for first light. Dawn breaks. It is a bright, sunny day. The artillery bombardment lifts. 7.30 a.m. Whistles sound along the lines. The men scramble up the ladders and out of the trenches. The largest British army ever mustered goes over the top. 141 days fighting begins. Tonight, we keep vigil to remember those who fought in the Somme offensive. As we keep watch, we hear their story. We listen to their voices and the voices of their families, the voices of those who worked behind the lines and in the war effort at home, and to German voices. By 1916, the war that was to be over by Christmas was well into its second year. Throughout that spring and into the early summer, troops, supplies and munitions converged on the Somme ahead of the coming offensive. Private Ted Ambrose was the first son of a working-class family in the small village of Wallington in Hertfordshire. He enlisted in the Bedfordshire Regiment in 1915 and was just 18 when he left for the front the following February. His father wrote to him before he sailed for France. Dear son, just a few lines to you, wishing they find you quite well and in the best of health, as I am pleased to tell you that this leaves us all the same at present. Well, dear son, no doubt you will think it strange to get a letter from Dad, but you know, I thought I must write you a few lines before you sail away from home. So let me, dear son, remind you that you are quite young, so therefore you must try and take great care of yourself. And don't forget to ask your Heavenly Father to help you to do that which is right each night before you lay down to bed, and also each morning ask Him to take care of you through the day. I hope, dear son, that you will take care of this letter and read it from time to time, and that you won't forget to do what I have asked of you. Don't forget to let us know as often as you can how you are getting along, and if there is anything you want, if we can send it you. So now, dear son, I think this is all. So with all our best love, and from one and all, to you, and heaps of kisses from your loving dad. Ted Ambrose arrived on the Somme in April 1916. He was wounded in the July and sent back through the medical evacuation chain to Etaple Base Hospital, where he died of his wounds on the 13th of July. Ted's mother sent telegrams to France requesting permission to visit her son in hospital. Her visit was authorised, as the timestamp shows, just ten minutes before Ted died. The authorization was found with Ted's possessions, which were returned to his parents after his death. On the home front, women were playing their part in the war effort. The demand for shells created new job opportunities. British industry had converted to war production, and women provided the unskilled labour in the munitions factories. Mrs. Adela Hall had come to London to help with the war effort. By early 1916, she had started work at Perivale National Filling Factory in the London borough of Lewisham. She later recalled what it was like to work there. I had never been in a factory before, but the crisis made you think. I thought, well, my brothers and their friends are in France. So a friend and I thought to ourselves, well, let's do something. So we went to London to ask for war work and we were directed to Perivale in London. We had to have a health examination, because you had to be very physically fit, have perfect eyesight, and be strong. We had to supply four references, and be British-born, and have British parents. We worked ten hours a day, no break, an hour for dinner, back again until half past six, no break. We single girls found it very difficult to eat after work, because the shops were closed. 
When we finished work, we had to do our work and try to get food, which was difficult. I remember going into a shop after not having milk for seven days. They said, if you can produce a baby, you can have the milk. That was it. I went into a butcher's shop to get some meat because we were just beginning to get rationed, and I said, that looks like cat, and he said, it is. I couldn't face that. It was a perfect factory to work in. Everybody seemed unaware of the powder around them, unaware of any danger. Once we heard, oh so-and-so has gone. Perhaps she had made a mistake and her eye was out, but there wasn't any big explosion whilst I was there. We worked at making these little pellets, very innocent-looking things, but if there had been the slightest bit of grit in these pellets, it would have been goodbye. We had to do a fortnight on and a fortnight off. It was terribly hard, terrible monotonous, but we had a purpose. There wasn't a drone in that factory, and every girl worked and worked and worked. I didn't hear one grumble and hardly ever heard of one that stayed home because she had her man in mind, although we all did. After each day when we got home, we had a lovely good wash, and believe me, the water was blood red and our skin was perfectly yellow, right down through the body, legs and toenails even, perfectly yellow. In some people, it caused a rash, a real nasty rash all round the chin. It was a shame, as we were a bevy of beauties and these girls objected very much to that. Yet, amazingly, even though they could do nothing about it, they still carried on, and some of them with rashes about half an inch thick. It didn't seem to do them any harm, just for skin. The hair, if it was fair or brown, went to beautiful gold, but if it was grey, it went grass green. It was quite twelve months after we left the factory before the yellow came out from our bodies. Washing wouldn't do anything, it only made it worse. Adela Hall died in 1985, aged 91. In preparation for the Somme Offensive, British troops were redeployed south from Ypres and Arras. Don Murray was born in Bradford in 1893 into a working-class family of six children. He vividly remembered the end of the South African War and seeing returning soldiers being given a hero's welcome. When Britain declared war in August 1914, Don decided to join up. He and his fellow apprentices went straight to the recruiting office and enlisted as a group in the King's own Yorkshire Light Infantry. Don arrived in France in May 1915. His battalion went over the top on the first day of the Somme, and by the end of the morning, Don was one of the few men who had not been wounded. Don went on to see service in Italy before returning home to Bradford. In December 1973, aged 80, he was interviewed by the Imperial War Museum. He recalled the build-up to the offensive. We went further down the line, further and further, until eventually, in early 1916, we took over from the French on the Somme. We didn't realise then what was in the offing, but we soon learned because we started making preparations, bringing up gas cylinders and preparing for a really big affair. In May, they took us from the line, back about 10 kilometres right away from the fighting, and there they had the whole front mapped out an exact replica of the German line with little flags, and we started practising for this big attack that was to come. In the meantime, there was this constant procession of guns, guns, guns going up. Instead of the big guns that used to lie miles back, they were bringing them right up to the front. In the lead-up to the offensive, the British had to keep a constant watch on the German lines. Sergeant Alex Patterson enlisted in the Rifle Brigade on the 8th of September 1914, arriving in France in 1915. He was wounded in the later stages of the Somme Offensive and honourably discharged from the army in early 1917. He was awarded both the Military Medal and the Distinguished Conduct Medal for gallantry in action. He recalled being sent out to gather intelligence. The grass was just like hay, so anything that was dark or anything that was too light, or was coloured, would show up. We had to wear as little equipment as possible. No belts or buckles, or anything that was likely to glitter in the sunshine. We had to really think about camouflage. We had to brown our hands and faces, and with my black hair, 
I had to wear a khaki handkerchief over my head with knots at the corners to keep it on. And because the weather was so hot, and our faces would be wet with perspiration, and even that could glisten in the sunlight, we covered our faces with grass seed. We crawled on our tummies, and we didn't keep to a straight line, as we might have furrowed the grass as we went through, and that would have certainly been seen by troops using periscopes on the other side. So we had to move to the left and then to the right on our bellies. And, as we got near to their line, we had to keep very close so we could whisper to each other and discuss the things we saw. We even had brown paper instead of white to write our notes on. Just a four-inch square which we put in our pockets. And then, if there was a bit of a shell hole, we would get into it and very cautiously make a sketch or two. Despite the fighting, people made plans for the future, for a life after the war. Captain Roland Phillips was born in London in 1890 to an aristocratic family. He was educated at Winchester and New College, Oxford, before being commissioned into the Royal Fusiliers. He was a friend of Baden-Powell, founder of the Scout Movement, and by 1913 was Scouting Commissioner for East London. Phillips and Baden-Powell corresponded regularly about the future of the Scout Movement after the war. Dear Chief, no words of mine can express the delight it was to me to get your letter. I feel ready for another bayonet charge, or anything else, straight away. It has always seemed to me that there are two special branches of activity for Scout Masters and Scout Commissioners. The first is to work with the boys and for them, and the second to try every day and every hour to set them an example of scout-like conduct. Out here, if one has few opportunities of doing the first, one may thank God, as indeed I do, for the supreme and never-ending chance one has of carrying out the second. It bucks me to hear you have work for me amongst the boys of Britain once the war is over. I long to come back and do it. It would be the moment of most perfect happiness in my life. Yet, beyond everything, I am certain of this, that nobody in this war dies by accident, and the loving creator who went with me when I bought my first scout hat and pair of short trousers will never take me to another world unless there is scouting to be done there also. It is this belief that makes me, bar none, the happiest person in the world. Thank you for that most wonderfully delightful letter. Yours very loyally, Roland E. Phillips. Roland Phillips was killed in action on the Somme by a sniper in July 1916. He was awarded the Military Cross. In June 1916, preparations for the offensive intensified. On the 24th of June, the artillery bombardment would begin, seven days shelling of the German lines before the British infantry attack on the 1st of July. The men worked at a feverish pace to sight and camouflage the heavy guns, sometimes meeting with the unexpected. 2nd Lieutenant Stuart Montague Cleave was born to a military family in Hampshire in 1894. He attended the Royal Military Academy at Woolwich before being commissioned into the 36th Siege Battery, Royal Garrison Artillery. After the war, he combined a successful career in the army with that of a professional musician. He died in 1993, aged 98. His battery was involved in preparations for the artillery bombardment at the end of June. We were the first battery to arrive with any guns bigger than 6 inch and caused a great deal of attention by the higher authorities because of the sheer weight of ammunition which these 8 inch howitzers could produce. They were monstrous things and very heavy but the machinery of the guns was very simple and that's why they did so extremely well and they didn't give nearly so much trouble as some of the more complicated guns that came later on. We moved to a splendid position near Beaumets. The guns were dug into an enormously deep bank about ten feet deep by the side of a field. The digging we had to get into that gun position was simply gigantic. We camouflaged it very well by putting wire netting over it, threaded with real grass. 
We had an awful job to manoeuvre the guns into it. We had to manhandle these enormous monsters. They each weighed several tonnes. When they were in position, they were very well concealed, so much so that a French farmer with his cow walked straight into the net and both fell in. We had the most appalling job getting this beastly cow out of the position. The man came out all right, but the cow... However, it was enormous fun. It was one of those delightful moments when you all burst out laughing. Army chaplains accompanied the troops. Services were held close to the front line, the men standing or kneeling on the ground, sometimes in front of a makeshift altar. Julian Bickersteth was born in Yorkshire in 1885. He was the third son of the Reverend Dr Samuel Bickersteth, then Vicar of Leeds, later Canon of Canterbury Cathedral and Chaplain to the King. Educated at Rugby and Christchurch, Oxford, Bickersteth was ordained in 1910, before going out to Australia in 1912 as chaplain to Melbourne Church of England Grammar School. He returned to England in late 1915, where he joined the 56th London Division as senior chaplain. He served with them on the Somme. This is from his diary entry for Sunday the 25th of June, 1916. One short but heartfelt service was interrupted during my address by five enemy aeroplanes, which came over and dropped bombs in a neighbouring field. I wanted the men to sit on the grass for the address, but the colonel, who was standing ten yards in front, whispered to me that he could have no movement of any kind made by the men, so I proceeded with my address, the men remaining standing. It is always hard to talk to a standing congregation, and when the air is rent with the sound of exploding bombs at no very great distance, it is not easy to keep the men's attention. But I caught them for a moment at the end, and more so perhaps during the blessing, having previously explained that I, as God's minister, was about to bless them in his name and ask for his protection for them in the great endeavour. The German planes had moved off by the time we had sung God Save the King, and so the battalion was able to march off the quite open space where the parade was held without fear of being detected. An aeroplane can never see the troops if the latter remain absolutely stationary. If they move, they can be spotted at once. Every man there knew that this might well be his last service on this earth, and although the note struck was one of joy, joy in self-sacrifice, joy in showing forth love which Christ himself showed on the cross, a joy in which we are all called upon to join with him, that love, casting out fear, might be ours. Yet there was no mistaking the solemnity of the occasion. Julian Bickersteth died in 1962, aged 77. He was awarded the Military Cross and twice mentioned in dispatches. Through the night of the 30th of June 1916, there was a flurry of communications up and down the lines. George Coward was a professional soldier in the Royal Engineers at the outbreak of war. He was one of the first servicemen to leave for France in 1914 with the British Expeditionary Force, and saw action on the Somme in July 1916. He recalls the night before the infantry attack. We sat all huddled together in this dugout, my pal and I taking and sending messages, and their officers talking together about their plans for the morning battle. As the time drew near for the zero hour, which was to be at 7.30am, the officers had some spirits and a jar of rum was opened and served amongst the troops. We few in the HQ dugout had a jar of rum between us, and had me and my chum drunk all that was offered us, we would have died of rum poisoning. As it was, we had a pint enamel cup between two. Rum was never a favourite drink of mine, so I just sipped it to keep the cold out, and my pal had some, for the same reason. Had we drunk it all, I'm afraid very few messages would have been sent by us, and that may have meant disastrous results for the troops going over, and ourselves. I well remember the adjutant picking up a glass of spirit and saying, Here's to the Hun when we meet him in the morning. Well, the night wore on, and near about the time of going over, the colonel and major left the dugout. I have never seen them since, and they were both killed later, I heard. George Coward returned home after the war and became a crane driver for Stothert and Pitt in Bath. He remained active with the Royal British Legion until his death in 1962. During the First World War, the Army used aircraft for reconnaissance. Lieutenant Cecil Lewis was born in 1898. 
He joined the Royal Flying Corps in 1915, aged 17. On the morning of the 1st of July 1916, he was flying over the Somme. Now the hurricane bombardment started. Half an hour to go. The whole salient, from beaumont Amel down to the marshes of the Somme, covered to a depth of several hundred yards with a coverlet of white wool, smoking shell bursts. It was the greatest bombardment of the war, the greatest in the history of the world. The clock hands crept on. The thrumming of the shells took on a higher note. It was now a continuous vibration, as if Wotan, in some paroxysm of rage, were using the hollow world as a drum, and under his beat the crust of it was shaking. Nothing could live under that rain of splintering steel. Now, the watch in the cockpit, synchronised before leaving the ground, showed a minute to the hour. We were over Tietval and turned south to watch the mines. As we sailed down above it all came the final moment. Zero. At Boiselle, the earth heaved and flashed. A tremendous and magnificent column rose up into the sky. There was an ear-splitting roar, drowning all the guns, flinging the machines sideways and repercussing the air. The earthy column rose, higher and higher, to almost 4,000 feet. There it hung, or seemed to hang, for a moment in the air, like the silhouette of some great cypress tree, then fell away in a widening cone of dust and debris. A moment later came the second mine. Again the roar, the upflung machine, the strange, gaunt silhouette invading the sky. Then the dust cleared, and we saw the two white eyes of the craters. The barrage had lifted to the second line trenches. The infantry were over the top. The attack had begun. Cecil Lewis was awarded the Military Cross and twice mentioned in dispatches. He was a founding member of the British Broadcasting Corporation and died in London in 1997, aged 98. For many of the PALS battalions, those who had joined up together when they had volunteered for Kitchener's new armies, the Somme was their first experience of a major offensive. Private Will Marshall was born in Burnley in 1893. He was working as a cotton weaver when he enlisted in the Accrington Pals on the 17th of September 1914. On the 1st of July 1916, his battalion went over the top, opposite the village of Serre in the northern sector of the Somme. They were just sweeping guns across. Men were falling at either side all around you. By the time I got there, there were three of my section left. And by the time we got to where we'd only got about 100 yards, must have done, to the German front line. And they'd gone back, you know. They weren't there. And there were just them three in my section left. They were Calvert and another fella, I forget his name at present, and me. Well, there weren't another man within 60 yards at either side of us. So you can tell how many had fell up to getting there. And we'd only gone about 100 yards. We'd got to like a big shell hole where a shell had dropped before previously and Calvert and this other boy went round to left, and I went round to right of this shell hole. We didn't go down it. Well, another shell came, and I was blown off my feet flat onto the floor. Didn't know where I were for a minute, and when I picked myself up, these two were missing. they are only me there. A bit of shrapnel had hit me in the arm, and another piece just across my leg. Well, there weren't another soldier within 60 or 70 yards either side of me then. Will Marshall was wounded in the action and spent nine months in hospital in Liverpool. After being discharged, he worked as a local munitions inspector. He died in 1995, aged 101, the last known member of the Accrington Pals. 1st of July, 1916. Dawn breaks over the Somme. At 6.25 a.m., the British bombardment intensifies. Lance Corporal Sidney Richards was born in West Bromwich in 1895. Before the war, he had worked as a glass silverer and a clerk. He joined the 137th Brigade Machine Gun Company and took part in the artillery bombardment before the men went over the top on the 1st of July. His account of the action at Gomacor that morning was published in the Trinity Church Parish Magazine. At last, the final morn arose. We had an early breakfast making teas in a very small dugout. Well, just a hole big enough for a few to squeeze in. And our rations were composed of hard biscuits, cheese and pickles. 
What a menu. But we enjoyed it because we were very hungry and we had a sandwich given to us for the next day. The sun rose majestically in all its glory and one couldn't help to think how horrible it was that this war should have been on. That only had to be momentary as our duty lay before us. I prayed earnestly for strength and guidance to do my duty and to go forward and follow my officer wherever he went. The time arrived for the smoke bombs to be sent over and it was like a dense fog and we were firing the guns at full speed. We sent thousands of bullets to a certain point and then we had to move to another part of the line after getting the water out of the barrel which was boiling. We then put in cold water to cool it and make it better for carrying. Up it goes on my shoulder and no light weight, about 68 pounds, in addition to what I was wearing or carrying. Box respirator, smoke helmet, bombs, haversack, water bottle and ammunition attached to my equipment, spare parts wallet. They were whiz-banging the trench all the way and I thought several times that I should have been killed. But my one thought was getting to this certain spot and with the help of God I reached it in safety. Perspiration was streaming down my face and my oil sheet was quite wet. I had forgotten to mention I was carrying that and also some sandbags. We were unable to get to the position and the order came along to fire from our former positions. So, up with the gun again and back we went, passing wounded men on the way. Our officer was absolutely splendid and kept so cool and collected all through. I could have done anything and gone anywhere with him. We moved the gun again and fired from the parapet and didn't we just rip them over? We took some trenches, but the men were only able to hold them on the right. The sergeant and I were at the gun all day and didn't leave it until midnight. And then, when we arrived at our dugout, it had been blown in by a huge shell. I thanked God with all my heart that we were out at the time. In 1917, Sidney Richards was recommended for a commission and sent to an officer cadet battalion at Purbright in Surrey. In May 1918, he returned to France as a second lieutenant, joining the 55th Battalion Machine Gun Corps. He died in 1950, aged 55. The men knew they might not survive the fighting that was about to begin, and many wrote last letters home. Lieutenant Charles Saunders was born in Lowestoft in 1888. When war broke out, he was working for the Beckles branch of Barclays Bank. He enlisted in the Scots Greys before being commissioned into the 15th Battalion, West Yorkshire Regiment. Before his battalion went over the top on the 1st of July 1916, he wrote a last letter home to his wife. My dearest Alma, I feel that I must write you a few lines. Tomorrow evening we go into action, and although I am placing my trust in divine providence and have every hope of doing my duty and coming through, I pen these lines. In the first place, you must be a brave girl. I feel that it is rather poor advice to give you, but for the sake of the dear little might, you must bear up and be the brave little dear woman that you are. I hope that with the government arrangements for the widows of fallen officers and my insurance, together with, I hope, the help that I expect from the pater, you will be comfortable and happy. I hope that you will be able to bring up the dear little Babs as we had wished. I am glad that we were able to get married, but it is hard to leave you and the little Babs. I am told off for a very important but dangerous job, but I hope to make a good job of it. I can hardly realise that we are to be parted. I am too optimistic altogether. I feel that I have a lot to tell you, but cannot. Take care of yourself. You are a dear girl, and I had hoped to have a long, happy life. Just you and I, and perhaps some dear little ones. But it is not to be. I am making arrangements so that in the event of anything happening, this will be sent on to you. Father has the papers that are necessary to put my affairs in order. You will doubtless read of the whole thing in the papers. My battalion has the post of honour. Well, my dearest old pet, 
I am fit and well, looking hopefully forward to tomorrow and trusting that in a few days I may destroy this letter. Give my love and kisses to Babs and explain to her when old enough the sacrifice we have made for the country. This village has been shelled today and at the time of writing the guns are flashing out. God be with you. Love, comfort and support you. I have made my communion and feel ready for all that which fate has ordained for me, trusting in God. With fondest love, I remain, dearest Alma, yours to all eternity, Charles. Charles Saunders' battalion left the trenches opposite Serre to be met by a hail of bullets and artillery shells. Within minutes, 24 officers and over 500 other ranks had been killed or wounded. Saunders fell in action, but his body was never identified. Today, he is remembered on the Tiepval Memorial to the Missing. The men who had volunteered for Kitchener's new armies had to adapt quickly. Private Jack Cousins was a farmer's boy from Trolley Bottom near St Albans. He enlisted with the 7th Battalion Bedfordshire Regiment in September 1914, along with ten of his friends. He later recalled his experiences on the Somme. It was a question of get stuck in and kill or be killed. It wasn't a question of wandering around the countryside looking for mushrooms. We had to get going. We were told, don't advance on your own. Go together at the same pace. If machine gun fire takes place, drop down flat to the ground. Our platoon officer said, you will find the barbed wire in front of the German trench blown away. Blown away? Nothing of the sort. It was as solid as anything. That was the whole trouble. We were disillusioned that it wasn't blown, and the Germans were firing at us from all angles. A lot of men were caught on the wire, and they were sitting ducks. We got into the front-line German trench, and my instructions were to follow the communication trench back to the German lines. Well, I had my Lewis gun, my head down below the trench my gun crew following behind with spare ammunition. Suddenly, I could hear voices in front. I knew that they were German. I stopped at the bend, and suddenly I saw, coming around the bend, Germans in single file. When they spotted me, they started to unsling their rifles, but I didn't give them a chance, and I drove my finger on the Lewis gun trigger, and with a burst from the gun, three or four of them dropped dead. The others threw down their rifles and came with their hands up. I signalled for them to get up and walk back to our people as prisoners. My number two was carrying a revolver, and there was nothing accurate about the thing, but he started to take pot shots at some of these Germans. I told him to shut up and be quiet. Then we came into a jerry dugout. The dugouts were very effective. They used to tunnel down yards and yards. I got hold of a Mills bomb, pulled the pin and threw it down the dugout. There was a bit of a bang after four seconds. Then I heard somebody moaning. I took a chance. I went down into the dugout, and there was this jerry laid with a great hole in his chest blood pouring everywhere, pointing to his mouth. I knew what he wanted. He wanted a drink. I gave him my water bottle. The water went in his mouth and came out of his holes. He was gone in a few seconds. It really upset me. I felt morally responsible for his death. Could have happened to me. Jack Cousins was awarded the Military Medal in September 1916 and survived the war unwounded. He made his last visit to the Somme in 1983. By 1916, the wounded would be taken first to a casualty clearing station for initial treatment before being transferred to a base hospital. Sister Edie Appleton was born in 1877 in Deal in Kent. She trained at St Bartholomew's Hospital and joined Queen Alexandra's Imperial Military Nursing Service. She describes hospital life in the days before and after the 1st of July. June the 25th. The hospitals all along the line are slack, waiting for the push. Three more sisters were sent up to clearing stations. I wish one had been me, although in my sane moments I know it is selfish and all ought to have a turn. But, if my chance comes to go again, I shall rejoice. July the 3rd. Our much longed for advance has begun after many days of heavy bombardment. We launched an attack at 7.30 on Saturday morning. They went over in waves. We took the front-line trenches for a distance of 25 miles. 
We had a couple of train loads of wounded down, 1,100 in all, 153 officers. Very dirty, and the London Scottish kilts were a sight to behold. July the 4th. Wounded. Hundreds upon hundreds, on stretchers, being carried, walking, covered from head to foot in well-caked mud. The rush and buzz of ambulances and motor buses is the only thing I can remember of yesterday. Horribly bad wounds, some crawling with maggots, some stinking and tense with gangrene. One poor lad had both eyes shot through, and there they were, lying smashed and all mixed up with the eyelashes. He was quite calm and very tired. He said, Shall I need an operation? I can't see anything. Poor boy, he never will. July the 6th. I give up description. It beats me. In ordinary times, we get a telegram from Abbeville saying a train with so many on board has left and is coming to us. Then they stopped giving numbers and just said, full train. Edie Appleton was awarded the Royal Red Cross and an OBE. After the war, she worked at Bedford College, London. She married in 1926 and lived on the Isle of Wight until her death in 1958, aged 80. Throughout the First World War, the post office delivered millions of letters a week to servicemen, their families and friends. Major Reggie Thompson was born in 1886. He joined the Royal Field Artillery in 1900 and was a major by the time of the Somme Offensive. On the 2nd of July 1916, he wrote home to his mother from the front. My darling mother, things are going very well, far better than they have ever gone before at any other battle, and we all feel most happy. There's been hard enough fighting, but we have got what we intended to get, and this is just the beginning. I hope things will go on all right. We had an anxious time yesterday for a bit, as it looked rather as if we weren't going to get our objective. But by hard pushing it came off, and we've got a nice tidy lot of prisoners. It's wonderful how these mount up. Little parties of twenty or thirty at a time turn into quite a nice figure. Unlike Luce, we have at present hung on to all we have captured, and all night and day has been spent consolidating what we have got. There are, again unlike Luce, large numbers of German dead all over the shop, so we are altogether very pleased. I think the Bosch had a very nasty knock yesterday. I've been this afternoon over the craters and the line generally. A most eerie feeling. Standing up in the open and looking over the ground we sort of squinted at through chinks for so many a month. I walked over the ground where the trenches were. It was like alpine climbing. Not a trace of trench anywhere. It's almost uncanny. We must start burying the dead tomorrow. The fighting on the Somme was to last a continuous 141 days. British and German armies rotated their troops. A stretch at the front would be followed by a period out of the line. Hans Schaefer was born in 1898. During the war, he served in a field artillery reserve regiment in the German army. He wrote home to his parents after seeing action on the Somme. Dear parents, Suddenly, all we have longed for so eagerly has become reality. We have been relieved. Can you imagine what that means? After 30 days of battle, we are going back home to the limbers. Cutting across country, not using any roads, unshaven, unwashed, with long and unkempt hair, so tired that the legs are nearly failing, that way I have trodden along with a fellow gunner. When we marched into the village, we could hear the peaceful sounds of an organ from the church. The contrast was nearly too much for me to bear. Admittedly, we are still in artillery range, but tomorrow we will probably move into our reserve positions. I suppose that after that, we will be transferred further north, where it is more quiet. After all, it is a miracle that any one of us is still alive. Sadly, the casualties are bad enough. Two officers and three NCOs dead. Added to that, half of the old gunners. That's quite enormous for a single battery. I won't even mention the thousand times I nearly perished myself. Thank God I am still alive. After a four-week assault, the English have finally managed to take Pozier. Now the pigs sit in our good dugouts, play our gramophone and drink our wine. But then, I couldn't care less, as long as I am here. 
I don't want to know about war any more. On that note, best wishes. Your Hans. Hans Schaefer survived the war. Fighting on the Somme pushed men to the edge of human endurance. Evan Jack Lloyd was born in Wales on the 14th of August 1891. He enlisted in September 1914 and served with the South Staffordshire Regiment before being selected for a commission in the field. He joined the 13th Cheshires in November 1915 as a second lieutenant and went out with them to the Somme in June 1916. He survived over six weeks of bitter fighting, taking his company into action on several occasions, and was commended for a decoration. Evans survived the war, working for Lloyds Bank in London until 1951, when he retired to his native Wales. It was here, among the hardy hill farming community of the remote Bowen Mountains, that he at last found peace, contentment, and precious solitude. Like so many of his generation, Evan never spoke of the war. His son Patrick recalled, So far as I know personally, not a single word concerning his experiences in World War I ever passed my father's lips, and I have never seen any written record either. I have always assumed that this period held such awful memories for him that he deliberately avoided recalling them. The Army Service Corps was in charge of supplies to the front, using motor vehicles as well as horse-drawn transport. Those few who were drivers in civilian life were in great demand in the Corps' mechanical transport companies. Corporal Osman Flowers joined up at Doncaster in October 1915. According to his enlistment documents, he was 5 feet 6 inches tall. After two months' training, he was sent to France as a driver in the mechanical transport section of the Army Service Corps, arriving at Rouen just before Christmas 1915. I was a driver. I'd been a driver before the war and a fitter as well. I had a licence, but in those days it didn't matter if you didn't have any legs on, if you didn't have any arms or even any eyes. If you wrote up for a driving licence and sent five shillings, you got one. I joined up in 1915. There was an offer advertised in the papers. Six shillings a day for drivers and fitters if they joined the army. Well, the Tommy was only getting a shilling a day, and I knew if I joined up I'd get my choice of job, but if conscription come in, that would be that. It wasn't just the money. I wanted to go into something where I didn't need to use a gun. It was all right until the Somme got really bad. We used to run the rations up to the line or as near as we could get. We used to help the Tommies up too because there was a tremendous number of troops going up. One of the worst jobs I used to have was when a division was going up. They were marching, of course, and we would relieve them of their blankets so that they wouldn't have to carry them. Well, they was all rolled up and it wasn't a case of this is my blanket, that's your blanket. You got a blanket and it didn't matter whose it was when you got to the end of your journey. Of course, these were all stuffed into my lorry until it was completely full. It wasn't so much a lorry full of blankets as a lorry full of lice. We were covered. They were all over us and that happened again and again. I was attached to the Motor Transport Department of the Army Service Corps and it was mainly supplies we were taking up to the dumps. We used to load up in the afternoon and deliver in the morning and there was every kind of thing we had to carry, including food and stuff for the mules and horses as they were further up the field than we were. One day you would load up with coal for the cooks, the next day you would be on tin stuff that was all on boxes, the next day you would be on hay. If you got that you were well away because we had to sleep in our lorries once we had loaded up, sleep literally on top of the load. One night we had frozen sides of beef. Well, there were horses, mules, men, bodies strewn all over the place. If hell was ever let loose, it was let loose then. A few of those nights I went out I used to dread going, not so much because of the danger to myself, but because I didn't know what damage I was doing to other people. You couldn't see them. It was too dark. Osman Flowers survived the war, but his wife, Adelaide, died of the Spanish flu the day before the armistice. He died in 1981, aged 90. On the 15th of September 1916, at the Battle of Flair Corselet, the British Army used tanks, the new land ships, for the first time. Hermann Kohl was 17 when war broke out. He joined the Bavarian infantry near the Franco-German border, fighting at Ypres in 1915. He was wounded at the Somme, but survived the war 
earning the Iron Cross, first and second class, for gallantry in action. After the war, he returned to the Rhineland, where in 1932 he wrote an account of his war experiences. He describes the new land ships in action. During the early hours of the 15th September, a forest of guns opened up in a ceaseless rolling thunder of fire throughout the Highwood, Flair, Martin Puig, Corselet sector. A sea of iron crashed down on all the front line and support positions in the area. The noise was terrible. Impact after impact. The whole of no man's land was a seething cauldron. The work of destruction grew and grew. Chaos. It was impossible to imagine that anyone could live through it. Square metre after square metre was ploughed up. The regimental Witch's Sabbath was upon it, as an unparalleled hurricane of fire blew over from the front. It was like a crushing machine, mechanical, without feelings, snuffing out the last resistance with a thousand hammers. It is totally inappropriate to play such a game with fellow men. We are all human beings made in the image of the Lord God. But what account does the devil take of mankind, or God, when he feels himself to be the Lord of elements, when chaos celebrates his omnipotence? From the direction of High Wood, we can hear a thousand voices and confused shouting, which persists until the few remaining survivors, wakened from mental confusion, find themselves shocked back into the reality of the moment and fight on, until the British flood overwhelms them, consumes them and passes on, wave upon wave. An extraordinary number of men, and there, between them, spewing death, unearthly monsters, the first British tanks. The tanks were a mixed success. As well as being dangerous to operate, they were an easy target for enemy artillery. Lionel McAdam was a gunner in one of the first tank crews. Having been barred from joining the Canadian infantry because he was too short, he paid his own passage across the Atlantic to join the British Army. He was in the heavy machine gun corps and aboard Creme de Month in that first tank action. One of the crew was struck by a flying splinter just after we started, and our tank, the Creme de Month, was forced to go into action with only six men and our crew commander. We proceeded to a place just in front of our own line, where we had to wait for daybreak. All night long, the terrific cannonading went on. Creme de Monte took two hits on the tail, which blew half of it away. The explosion of each shell lifted the 35-ton monster onto her nose and then let her drop again with a bang which shook the crew pretty thoroughly. Zero hour for the Canadians was 5.30am on the 15th. We started the engine and, when a lull in the firing gave us the signal, we started off. Dawn was just breaking, and there was a little ground mist which slowly disappeared as the sun came up. We moved along at the rate of about two or three miles an hour, pitching in and out of the shell holes and over all sorts of obstacles. In the mist, we could make out the forms of our men following us up. Machine guns were pattering all over the side of our old bus, and the infantry outside were catching it rather hard. As soon as the mist cleared sufficiently for the Germans to see us, their fire died away appreciably. Creme de Monte and Cordon Rouge were running parallel courses about 200 yards apart. We reached Sugar Trench together and stopped with our guns pointed at a mass of Germans in the trench. The infantry came up and took all these as prisoners. Lionel McAdam was wounded in January 1917, but soon returned to active service, salvaging and repairing broken-down tanks from the battlefield. He returned to Canada in 1919, where he resumed work as an electrical engineer with the Toronto Transit Commission. He married and had two sons. He lived in Toronto until his death in 1973, aged 82. By the autumn of 1916, the weather had turned. Private John Jackson came from Glasgow and was working for the Caledonian Railway when war was declared. 
He enlisted with the 6th Battalion Cameron Highlanders, with whom he would serve for over four years. Jackson saw action at Luce before arriving on the Somme in the autumn of 1916. Leaving Brel in the afternoon, we marched in heavy rain and over almost impossible roads to Becor Wood. We expected to get billets in some old wooden shelters, but there were not enough to go round, and the signalers were lucky to find room in an old cookhouse in a trench called Tiger Pop. What with being wet to the skin and everything around us in a soaking condition, we were in a very miserable state. But we set to work and built a great roaring fire to dry and warm ourselves while the rain kept pouring down all night. We rested the next day in preparation for entering the front line at night. At seven o'clock in the evening, we set off to relieve the Norfolks, whose position was supposed to be somewhere in front of Highwood. Owing to heavy fighting in the sector at this time, the front line was never long in the same place. Old trenches were constantly being blown up by shell fire, and new ones dug every night, so it was not an easy task in trying to find the men we were meant to relieve. The whole valley of the Somme at this time was little better than a sea of mud, and roads were terrible to march over. Passing through Death Valley strewn with dead bodies of men and horses, and the wreckage of transport columns, with now and then great bursting shells falling around us, we struggled as best we could till dark. To try and keep ourselves as dry as possible, we walked our way along the edge of trenches, feeling our way cautiously forward in the darkness. All went well until we got close to Highwood, when a few shells landed a score of yards to our right and our officer ordered us into the communication trench for safety. For a few minutes we scrambled along through mud and water up to our waists. After such a hard march, it was now midnight. This almost finished us, and we cursed the officer for having ordered us into such a place. At last, completely exhausted, we reached the wood which had previously been a German stronghold. The wood was now reduced to a tangled mess of broken trees and smashed wire defences, through which, in various directions, ran lines of trenches. The trenches were full of bodies, both British and German. They lay in grotesque shapes, some indeed stood propped against the parapet, and more than once in the inky darkness, we spoke to men who were beyond the power of answering our questions. Always there was the possibility of running into the enemy lines, We were all strangers to the ground, so we tried to make as little noise as possible. Added to the invisible uncertainties and terrors of the night arose the nauseating stink of the dead and rotting human flesh. Small wonder, men's hair turned grey in a night. John Jackson was awarded the Military Medal at Ypres in 1917. He was demobilised in 1919 and returned to work for the Caledonian Railway. In 1926, he wrote a memoir describing his wartime experiences. Bad weather and heavy cloud cover added to the chaos on the battlefield. Able seaman Joe Murray was born in 1896. He served with the Hood Battalion, 63rd Royal Naval Division, in the Gallipoli Campaign in 1915. Following the British withdrawal from the Dardanelles, his battalion found itself on the Somme. Joe describes the scene on the front line. It was very misty, a really wet mist. It wasn't a scotch mist, it was a double scotch mist, nasty, wet and claggy. As soon as the barrage opened, the sky turned red, just like the ironworks at home across the Derwent Valley. When they were drawing their furnaces, you'd get a red glow, and that was the picture I saw looking back over the lines at our own barrage. The whole sky was lit up, and you could feel the shells. You could actually feel the damn things going over your head like a wind in the fog. There were 12 or 13 rows of barbed wire in front of the first trench, and when the bombardment goes into that, it's supposed to cut it. But it doesn't destroy the wire. It builds it into a bloody heap with gaps in it here and there. And when the enemy's alive and awake to the idea that you're coming, they've got their machine guns trained on these gaps. Therefore, you get slaughtered. But we got through it, Some of us, anyhow. There didn't seem to be many of our chaps around as we pressed forward and entered the second line. The Drakes and Nelsons got all mixed up, and on the left they were all banging and crashing about, and there was terrible fire coming from this redoubt. It was a square of trenches lined with men manning machine guns, probably a hundred men in it, and it wasn't even touched by the artillery. How they missed that, Lord only knows. We had terrible casualties. 
when we got into the second line, there were hardly any of us about. We were supposed to rest there for 40 minutes so the next lot could go through us and take the green line. It was General Freiburg who got us together and led us on, and there were all too few of us, believe me. But we went on and captured the green line, although there was nobody on our left at all by then. Joe Murray was severely wounded on the Somme, but survived the war. He returned to the battlefields he had fought on several times. He died in January 1994, aged 97. The troops were often exhausted and hungry. Company Sergeant Major George Gregory was born in London in 1890. He joined his local territorial battalion in 1914, serving with them overseas from November that year. He remembers being on the march. We strode along together and talked, mostly grumbling about the alterations of rendezvous and eventually arrived at Crucifix Corner, where the battalion were rolling blankets. They had three or four hours sleep, having had breakfast and all. To say I was mad is to put it mildly. I went to one cook, who had been doing nothing much for four days, and at last got a cold rasher of bacon and a piece of bread to eat. I had been out in the open in an attack, and had no sleep for three nights. I'd marched God knows how many miles to an altered rendezvous, and here I was expected to like it. Moreover, be on parade and set the company an example and possibly march 10 to 15 miles to prove it. We eventually arrived at Valois, but at what hour I have no recollection. I have noticed that details during periods of great fatigue elude me, no matter how hard I try to recall them, and this is one of them. Whether we stayed at Valois more than one night, I cannot say, but we left a railhead town and entrained for an unknown destination within a day or two. Long before we got there, I knew where we were going. I could feel that awful damp chill of Belgium in November, pervading our carriage. So it is goodbye, Somme. Until next time. George Gregory was awarded the Military Medal and went on to serve in the Second World War, reaching the rank of captain. In civilian life, he was a farmer. He died in July 1980, aged 93. On the 18th of November 1916, the Battle of the Ancre drew to a close. Winter was setting in and active offensive operations ceased. The following summer, war artist William Orpen returned to the Somme. I had left it mud. Nothing but water, shell holes and mud. The most gloomy, dreary abomination of desolation the mind could imagine. And now, in the summer of 1917... No words could express the beauty of it. The dreary, dismal mud was baked white and pure, dazzling white. White daisies, red poppies and a blue flower, great masses of them, stretched for miles and miles. The sky a pure dark blue, and the whole air, up to a height of about forty feet, thick with white butterflies. Your clothes were covered with butterflies, it was like an enchanted land, but in the place of fairies there were thousands of little white crosses, marked unknown British soldier for the most part. Orpen had been appointed an official war artist for the British Army in 1916. He made several visits to the Somme, including the one in the summer of 1917. The Battle of the Somme in 1916 was the longest British offensive on the Western Front during the First World War. There were moments of success, but they came at a price. British troops were volunteers, many of them soldiers in Kitchener's new armies. For Australians, New Zealanders and South Africans, this was their first experience of fighting on the Western Front, and the new tanks were unwieldy and unreliable. Lieutenant General Sir Henry Rawlinson was born in London in 1864. His father was a diplomat. Rawlinson was educated at Eton and Oxford before going on to the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst. In 1916, he was appointed to command the 4th Army, reporting to General Haig, who held supreme British command at the Somme. After the offensive, in December 1916, Rawlinson wrote to Lord Derby. 
It was very good of you to send me a wire of congratulations, which I much appreciate. The battles of the 15th and the 25th of September at Flair Corselet and Morval were certainly very successful, more so than I dared to hope, but the weather was very kind to us. Nothing could have surpassed the vigour and dash displayed by all the New Zealanders, the 41st and 14th Divisions, all of Horn's 15th Corps, which formed my centre on the 15th. But the attack of the 6th Division against the Quadrilateral was hung up, and they did not succeed in capturing it until the 18th. This made the task of the Guards' Division very difficult, and I fear their losses are heavy. But they did their jobs, as the Guards always do. The tanks, in certain instances, such as at Flair and Martin Puich, rendered very valuable service, but they failed to have that effect on the fighting which many of their strongest advocates expected. They laboured under very great difficulties. They had great difficulty in maintaining their direction, owing to their limited vision, and their very low speed over ground torn by shells was a very serious handicap. The outstanding fact which of all others is the most satisfactory and which has been most marked during the Battle of the Somme, is the valour and tenacity of the infantry. They have fought with a determination which one had never dared hope for. It is in the new armies and amongst the Dominion troops that the fighting spirit has been most marked, and the successes gained by these troops, led by half-trained officers and in many cases only partially trained themselves, are most remarkable. When during the coming winter special attention has been given to further training, I have great hopes that they will, in 1917, establish a much greater moral and physical superiority over the enemy than they have been able to do up to the present. During the Battle of the Somme we have learnt many lessons and are continuing daily to benefit by experience. General Lord Rawlinson died in Delhi in 1925, aged 61.